Okay. So uh, welcome to uh, session eight of Sustainable Rural Systems. And uh, today's class, we are really fortunate to have a guest speaker with us. And who better to speak to doctoral students than someone who has been through that journey more recently than I have. <laughs> and it is <laughs> and a journey. <laughs> it is a journey. And also someone who um, uh, impresses me uh, with his work that combines different traditions in, uh, in the environment, uh, in environmental design uh, field, who would bring fresh eyes and perspective to the notion of sustainability, hmm. to interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity in thought and practice at the doctoral level. And I think uh, Dr. Martin Holland, we're very happy to have you here in class with us. Well, so thank welcome. You. Thanks so much. And you now have the floor to be able to tell us a little bit about the role of theory in doctoral research. And these doctoral students are very keen because in That's this awesome. class, we're all about theory. And our journey will continue for another semester. So your, your wisdom at this point is, is really timely. And Fantastic. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation. So uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, just a little bit of background for my, for just so you know where I'm coming from and my perspective. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree at Dalhousie in philosophy, and at the time I thought like by my third year as a major, I was like I don't want to do this for like there's not a lot of call in the job want ads for professional philosophers. So it was a good solid undergraduate education taught me how to write and read effectively. Um, but I thought like, okay, this is one of those things that you do and you find something else as your career. And what I didn't really know is that it did kind of instill a love of intellectual theory and intellectual history into my background, which especially in the field of landscape architecture doesn't often kind of come up. Um, I went on and did a master's degree at the University of Virginia uh, to become a professional landscape architect. I've worked professionally for about six years in total and totally got burned out and kind of disgusted by the field and took the thinking of, about the role of theory and how little ideas were talked about in terms of professional projects. Um, <coughs> This often led to some heated debates within offices because you're being told, like we have a, I remember one project in particular where we had a contract in the Caribbean to develop a, a planned resort. And this was after September the 11th, so there's all this market research in terms of thinking about like, oh, you know, people from New York, they don't want to fly anymore, so they only want to fly like an hour or two at most. So the developer wanted to basically develop like Southeast Asia themed uh, resort, like basically an Indonesian or Thai style resort in the Caribbean. And I'm like, but this, like there's no, why would you, why would you install one culture on top of another that's really rich? And of course this island, I think the unemployment rate at that time was about 50%. And then all of a sudden it's like, so yes, you're gonna develop this as an island and you're gonna give people jobs, but then their jobs of like being like bartenders and hotel maids. Is that really the kind of economic development that you want to see going on this island? Um, so after that conversation, I left. <laughs> so so there, there's a wide range about how theory comes up. I did my PhD at the University of Illinois, um, specifically in landscape architecture, looking at history and theory. So I really, it's taken me a while to kind of own the mantle of landscape historian because I never considered myself a historian, but then it was my love of intellectual history that really kind of reinforced like, no, this is something that you do and um, it's really, really interesting. So I, I tried to think about what would be the most useful thing for you at this particular stage in your own academic career. So I have a presentation that I'll, I'll go through but pretty quickly because I'd like to really have more of a discussion, but I'm hoping that this gives you an idea about how you can take intellectual theory and then start to apply it to your own doctoral research. research. So I, I wrote my dissertation on um, the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum in Oklahoma City. This was created after the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow building uh, in 1995. And um, 
I'm coming from a very particular kind of context, and I'm also going to share with you some of the struggles that I had with my own kind of doctoral research, and you know those things like Helen's mentioned, like your project statements or you're having your thesis, uh, how important those are to be really clear ahead of time, because if you're not, you can find yourself going down rabbit holes, and it's a wonderful journey, but then all of a sudden you realize, like I've spent three or four weeks chasing my tail and not actually being productive. The other thing that I just want to kind of bring to your attention, and, and I know there's a wide variety of uh, backgrounds and interests, one of the texts that I would really recommend people to look, uh, to look up is this one called Key Thinkers on Space and Place. It's by Sage Publications. And it basically gives you like a summary of about, mm, well, 50 of the top kind of space and place-based theorists running the gambit from Homi Baba to David Sibley, David Harvey, Foucault. And so it's, it's like, this is where I put on my professor, professorial hat and say, this isn't a replacement to actually read those authors, but it's a really good way of like reading them first, reading a summation and then understanding what you're actually reading when you're reading, you know, Foucault or you're trying to make your way through Henri Lefebvre and talking about social construction of space and you're like, what is this? Like, it provides a great in intellectual scaffolding, okay? Uh, and if you have any questions, please, I, I want this to be more of a conversation than it is like the whole sage on a stage, that's, that's not me, so I'd much rather have a conversation with you. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Um, so I know that m most people probably don't know the memorial in Oklahoma City, so I was going to give you a really kind of quick overview to begin with, and then I'll t kind of pivot and talk about how I started to develop my own research agenda, and then how I saw kind of the intellectual theory start to come in and start to augment things, okay? So so, um, if this works, there we go. Um, so the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum was constructed in, an immediate, in a really incredibly short time frame. Um, so the bombing happened on April 19th, 1995, and within three days there was already a conversation that was happening through a editorial that was run in the local newspaper, the newspaper of record actually for the city and for the state, uh, basically claiming like we need to build a memorial. So it, it's difficult at times to think back pre 9-11. So this, is, this was kind of an event that really had gripped like national headlines uh, in the United States. And they had film crews there from around the world. And this, like Oklahoma City prior to that was a pretty like, like provincial state capital. It wasn't really well developed. Um, they didn't really have the infrastructure. They often felt kind of neglected. So this act of kind of domestic terrorism really like it, it, it sent like a, a wave of three or fear through the United States because the assumption was in the initial press coverage included that this was somehow an act of foreign terrorism and even still there's a very strong conspira conspiracy theory that says there's actually a third man who is of Middle Eastern descent completely unfounded massive manhunt for this third person that just doesn't exist and uh, it's also a really interesting framework to show how much basically white nationalism plays in terms of terrorism in the United States. It never gets addressed as terrorism, so that's a whole other, and that was a, that was a rabbit hole that I went down, so that's the first rabbit hole that I ran into. Um, it, it, the thing that was really amazing to me, when I, and I stumbled upon this topic um, kind of by accident, like my wife had a conference in Oklahoma City and it's like, do you want to go to Oklahoma City? And I was like, no, I don't, <laughs> not at all. Why would I do that? And she's like, oh, come on, it'll be fun. I'm like, there's nothing fun about this. And I, I have to admit, like, it was, it's a very different culture. Um, and it's a different culture from most of the places that I lived in the United States. And it's definitely a different culture than coming from a Canadian context. When that call went out to talk about um, a memorial, 
The thing that I want to just call attention to is how specific they were in terms of the different victims that were affected by this bombing. So hopefully you can start to see the way that they even named some of these elements were basically demographic groups that were present at the time of the bombing. So uh, you have like the survivor's tree, the rescuer's orchard, so the people that were first responders, like the police, fire, ambulance, <coughs> nurse crew, even the search and rescue teams, construction crews. Um, you've got the children's area. There are 19 children that were killed in the bombing. Um, the, the ground floor of the Murrow building actually had a daycare, um, which Timothy Mepe and Terry Nichols knew about at, before when they were planning this bombing, um, as well as the field of empty chairs, which is actually a physical manifestation of an individually named uh, insertion, so they're a memorial marker. And, and I'll show images of all of this in just a moment. Uh, a survivor's wall, which is also kind of strange when you think of this as a memorial. So you've got some kind of built or constructed element to someone that's actually survived this kind of tragedy. You don't normally think of a memorial kind of honoring um, the survivors. And then there's also these two very large kind of, they call them the gates of time, which um, try to like, they try to symbolically freeze the moment they, they establish like a urban boundary into the site. So there's some kind of like transgressive act that you go through that you're supposed to be forever changed by walking through these gates. And you're living at that internal, eternal moment of 902. So that's the time of the actual bombing. So just to kind of quickly give you an idea, here's one of the gates of time. This is the mission statement. This is um, the face that's facing the city. So you don't realize the time until you're actually internal into the actual Memorial Museum. Um, it's, this memorial statement is, is kind of uttered almost like a prayer. So any kind of official meeting, if it's a staff meeting, They'll actually say this as like a mantra before they have any kind of official business. So this is always kind of a constant reaction or kind of introduction back to their mission statement. That is their active mission statement. Uh, this is the reflecting pool. So this is supposed to also be a delineation between the footprint of the Murrow building, which would be on my left where those pine trees are. And then there's the former Journal Records building to my right. The, the, the most controversial aspect in the urban planning kind of context for the memorial was the actual closing of the of Fifth Street, which used to run uh, like to connect the urban kind of connective tissue. And of course, that's the location where McVeigh parked the rider truck with a bomb. So there's a way that they basically took a city block and doubled it by closing off the street. And in Funnily enough, like it was the most pushback they got to the memorial design was like about closing the road. Like, oh, you're gonna cause traffic nightmares. This seemed to be the primary concern. Uh, here's the survivor's wall. Um, it's got all, and this became a very hot and contentious issue, partially because there was a rumor that there's gonna be financial compensation. So if you are wounded, if you needed multiple surgeries, then there's talk that if your name was on like the official list of survivors, um, there'd be some kind of financial compensation for you. This is one of those differences between Canada and the United States. All of a sudden, when you're responsible for your own medical bills, which could easily run into hundreds of thousands of dollars if you had multiple injuries or surgeries, versus having kind of a socialized, you know, central kind of care. So this is also part of a financial, financial compensation. And this is also incredibly difficult and contentious in the sense of who qualifies as a survivor, right? So they actually had to establish a perimeter boundary where, and there's a, this also starts to feed into a victim hierarchy. So if you lost a child, you're pretty well at the top of that social order. And if you were wounded, that gave you a certain kind of social, um, um, social power. Uh, and then there are people that were in the area but weren't actually injured. And so, it, you know, there's some people that lost like two children and a spouse. So like, they're, like there's a strange hierarchy that also emerged in terms of how do you speak as a victim. 
The funny thing is, is also just the placement of this. It's on a southwest edge, and the names have kind of completely been bleached by the sun. So what happens is like there's a lot of complaint by people who felt that they were wounded, but like because they didn't actually die, their family was put in this kind of strange financial kind of um, situation where they had to be responsible for the medical bills, but if they had actually passed away, they would have received compensation both from the state and federal governments. <coughs> so it's a, we it's a weird social order in terms of thinking of just about finances. Uh, field of empty chairs. So uh, these are, they're spatially located in terms of where they believed the victims were roughly occupying within the floor plan of the mirror building. So there's a strange kind of community of the dead that's formed by the placement of them. So if you were with a coworker, if you're working on the third floor in a certain area, that started to be a determining factor where your chair would be located. Um, these are very popular at, um, for anniversaries, so mementos get left there, messages, and this is part of the larger civic purpose that the museum plays. And I would argue that the museum now views itself as the moral conscience of Oklahoma City. So they, uh, they've defined themselves as not only as a museum, but a tourist attraction. And also, like, they, they run a series of programs that really have nothing to do with ter terrorism, but rather they run an anti-bullying campaign, they run uh, a memorial marathon. So they've kind of repositioned themselves to try and occupy this space where it's not a religious group that provides that kind of moral center, but rather it's the institution itself, which is also kind of fascinating it, right? Uh, so all the chairs are actually named. They have their names and etched on them. You can also see that the children, I'm sorry, at the upper left-hand corner, uh, children are also identified in the same way, but their chairs are two-thirds scale. So there's a spatial reflection of like the loss of children within the field of empty chairs. And at night, uh, those chairs, those bases light up, right? So it provides this kind of ghostly, ethereal quality. Um, the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum is the only affiliate of the National Park Service. And what that basically means is that it's actually a private organization, but it, it masquerades itself as being public space. Uh, this was something that was determined like <coughs> by a stroke of a pen. Um, originally they were part, they were a full functioning part of the National Park Service. There were multiple disagreements. Um, so the National Park Service put on requirements for the organization to say this is like, there's a whole host of rules and regulations to become part of the National Park Service. They sidestepped all of them. So what would normally be required is that you need to have 30 years of data in terms of establishing a national park. It's normally very much an ecological uh, system that's approached like environmental assessments in order to say, because most people are thinking of like Yosemite or you know Acadia National Park. Um, it's unusual because this is really in like a very built up urban condition. The, um, the organization, the memorial organization behind the foundation sued the federal government for uh, to become its own independent agency, but then have Park Service officials basically volunteer on site. And under George W. Bush, this was signed into law. So they sued um, the National Park Service, which was also like cash strapped at the time for about $600,000, which was the back pay for the agents that they had on, on site. And even if you go on their website, if you, if you type in nps.gov, you can find this listed as being part of the National Park Service. But make no, no mistake, this is private space that's policed and enforced, and it's not like this is a privately run organization. So you're starting to see some themes that are emerging that are like should be kind of like setting off some alarm bells, hopefully by now, um, with regards to like how does it actually operate, thinking about public space, who controls this, who has the power, there's this kind of social formation as well. Uh, the children's area, this is just part of the entrance way into the museum. Um, they do this kind of strange, like these are chalkboards where they kind of write their own messages. 
you'll see primarily either religious messages or messages of nationalism, which is also like kind of creepy. Um, yeah, it's really creepy. I shouldn't say kind of creepy, it's really creepy. Uh, the Rescuer's Orchard. Here's the survivor's tree as it was in 90, 1995, immediately after the bombing. This became a really, like, um, this is the social heart of this memorial. Uh, it's much better today, it's the same tree. Um, they've cloned it and they give out saplings that you can plant, so it's also kind of strange and odd. Um, but the survivor's tree actually became a really imp important part in my dissertation because it served as a really good analogy, and I'll, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, the museum itself is populated by this kind of notion of like it was a day like every other, and really started to address ideas of imagine yourself being in the situation of going to work as like you would any other normal day and having this tragedy hit you. And the, the problem that I had and what got me interested, and this is a dissertation topic, was they had a display that said, here's Americans' perception of terrorism in the United States between 1985 and 1995. And the only perceivable instance that they indicated was the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. And so I'm looking at this and it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would think. I, that's the thing that comes to my attention. And then they had another illustration of like the actual instances of terrorism in the United States between in that decade. And there were about 35 or 40 different instances. And so I started to look at the, the actual context, the context, and it's like, there's one in like my hometown. Like I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And it's like, I've never heard of this. Like, so what, what qualifies as an act of terrorism? So I write down dutifully all the different instances and like I spend 20 minutes in, the, in really part of a museum that like ha you haven't even gone into the main display area. And I start to research them and I realize how much like the FBI, like there were about five or six different kind of ecological terrorist attacks, like the cutting down of, uh, of a telephone pole in Santa Cruz, California. And I'm like, why would you think that that would act like, so it was very much like concerns of like ELF, the Earth Liberation Front, Earth First, and like that was the thing that the FBI was really focused in on as terrorism in the United States at the time. So it started again, these alarm bells went off, like there's something else going on here. How do you define terrorism? Who's the law enforcement agency? And th that is another rabbit hole, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. I have text on my screen, but it's not appearing here. So let me just see what is going on. That's really odd. Let me just try something here. That's super strange. Yeah, this monitor has a mind of its own. All right. So uh, I'm just going to refer to this so you can see it. So these really were the questions that I started to ask myself in terms of my dissertation. So the first one is why was the memorial designed with such a strong emphasis on specific demographic groups? Again, the rescuers, children, survivors. And why this particular design over all the other designs? There, were, there was an international competition that was held. They had 624 different entries, but why was this one selected as the winner? Who decided the winning entry? What was their process? What was their stake in the outcome? And then what was the spatial impact on the bombing with regards to the memorial? So like you have this uh, instance, it was a federal building. What were the after effects or like what were the ripples in terms of a spatial condition that happened after the actual memorial was con constructed? And let me just go down the next slide. I think only part of these came in, so I'll just talk about them quickly. Um, so this is how I started to frame like an intellectual f um, lens in terms of who I was reading, what I was thinking about. So um, here are my three kind of favorite characters. They're theorists, uh, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. 
if you're familiar with their work, they're also kind of known as being um, creating the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? So this, this understanding of like what you see isn't exactly what's going on. So if you think about Freud and the theory of the unconscious, that the way that you're behaving, you think you can rationalize it, but there's something actually much deeper going on that needs to be explored. With Marx, it was really about how social relations and, and ec were really based on economic relations. Um, and in turn, you really need to be able to kind of dive in and start to really interrogate the materials about those kind of relationships to understand how things actually evolve the way that they evolve. And then Nietzsche really, um, the thing that I found most useful was this kind of line of attack, or I shouldn't say attack, a line of inquiry um, that has to do with revealing a genealogy of things. So what I was really attempting to do was to establish a, uh, and understand the intellectual history and genealogy about how the memorial came to be and then starting to look at the intellectual framework that these three start to play and have the ripples effect on my own research. <coughs> The other thing that I just wanted to kind of point out is like it, when you're in a class like this, you, you really feel like an incredible debt to the writers and thinkers that came before you. And so here are some of the other people that I read that were then offshoots of, so Friedrich Nietzsche, if you, I hope you've read Foucault. Um, if you haven't, you need to start reading Foucault. Like that's like, you have to read Foucault. Um, and then also Michel Doucetteau. Um, incredibly useful, especially if you're doing this kind of uh, interrogation or understanding about how things evolve. So a questioning of <coughs> social relations, political relations. So you're, what's actually kind of surprising when I, when I put together these, these slides is like, I wasn't really that concerned with environmental conditions that would normally be associated with landscape architecture or even aesthetics. And in fact, the whole aesthetic category caused me to trip numerous times. So I was really much more interested in about seeing how this institution worked, for lack of a better term, like as a Marxist uh, geographer. Like that would probably be the strongest approach that I took. Um, Dennis Cosgrove, I don't know if you know uh, his work, Social Formation of, Social Formation of a Landscape. Uh, and then David Harvey, if you ever have a chance to see David Harvey lecture, go. He is amazing. He can speak for two hours, and the amount of material that gets communicated in two hours is breathtaking. Doesn't use a PowerPoint, has no notes, can just talk off the top of his head. Amazing experience. So what I was really concerned with from these intellectual kind of components is to be able to say, here, here is an intellectual approach that I'm using to really examine the materials and understand how this memorial was constructed. Um, for Freud, that was really more um, in terms of like trauma therapy. So I make the argument in my dissertation that the memorial was actually serving a social need as a therapeutic landscape. And I make the argument that you go through the museum to be traumatized. Like you go through to experience, and they framed it as like a day like any other. This horrible thing happens to you. You then go through this chaotic landscape of broken objects. You go, you experience firsthand, it's like a simulacra. And then you go out to the memorial to then have the soothing pastoral landscape kind of soothe that trauma away. And it's kind of insidious, and it's really kind of um, grotesque. So those were the primary thinkers, um, hopefully, and hopefully we're back on track here. Um, yeah, okay, so the other thing I just wanted to kind of call to your attention was just <coughs> the act of like you're going through and you're doing your reading list, you're doing your lit review, and these were some of the the primary uh, people that I was reading that were directly talking about Oklahoma City. So it gives you a little bit of a, a range, and I think this is also really important for your own work, where it's trying to be, or I would encourage you to think about looking to other disciplines to see how they handle certain topics. 
Um, so I've got everything from religious studies, folklore, media and communications, of course, history, and American studies. And the funny thing was, by this time, so like in 2010, when that book came out, I spent a week just completely crestfallen because there's like, mm, there's a chapter in it on Oklahoma City and it felt like, damn it, like she beat me to it. This is like what I was trying to do. And she's even more, she was, there's a difference between a book that's released to the general public and a dissertation, right? And like my dissertation, the first chapter uh, was like 120 pages long. It was ridiculous. And it was a physical description, and this is because my primary advisor was an art historian who wants to know every single, like, what was the measurement of the spacing of the construction, of like of the contraction lines in the concrete. And I'm like, oh my God, like the driest, driest thing ever. So word of note, don't have an art historian be your <laughs> PhD advisor, okay? So like, you can sidestep that. But what I realized was like I read, I read Erica Doss and I was like, she got it wrong. No, and like there are things that she says and it's like, have you even been here? Like I was indignant. Like so it's like, all right, this is fine. You now have a conversation partner and you have something to write against. So she's in the dissertation. I've met her, she's very, very nice. And we've had great conversations, um, but she was wrong. So this is the other thing is like, be confident in sticking your own territory and your own work. So those were like, again, very broad uh, topics. Uh, Linenthal was basically the kind of the linchpin. Um, the other thing that I kind of discovered going through the archive was that uh, I met another legal scholar from the same, so she was very much interested in the role of victim impact statements on a legal trial. So she's a legal scholar. She was from Indiana Law School. That's where he taught. And she's told me, and I can't prove this, that the institution paid him to write that book. And I was like, what? That's, his, that's what? That is like, that will not stand. And it's like, well, he's donated all of his papers. So he's a noted uh, historian, kind of religious study. Like they're all there in Oklahoma City. It's like, there's something, there's something funky going on with that relationship. He might just be very, very sympathetic and wants to support the institution. I couldn't find any evidence that he was paid for it. So like it's one of those things you just have in your back pocket and it's like, I wish I knew this, but it changes how you'd read that book if you knew that the institution itself paid for it, right? Because it's a promotional material more than anything else. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit off track. One of the things that started to, when I was doing this archival research, was I started to realize that um, and I'm, trying to, and I'm trying to be generous here, is that the, the, the people involved immediately after the bombing felt like they had this huge rift within their community. And um, I read a statistic that basically um, one in seven people in Oklahoma City at the time lost someone in the bombing, either directly or they knew someone who died, right? So this is like a small number of people, relatively speaking. Um, and yet the impact on that community was huge. So they're at a loss, and I think immediately they're saying like, well, all right, we're getting all the social pressure, this letter to the editor, they want to build a memorial, how do we do this? And they, they form a subcommittee, right? They do a good, like, we need a, we need a committee to address this. Well, the committee is made up of 350 people. Like, you can't get anything done in the committee of six, let alone 350 people. So there is a subcommittee that was in charge of like, well, we need to really solicit input, public input. And here's how, like, I just wish that one of those members of the committee had some kind of training in terms of how you do an actual survey. Because I think if you start to read the survey, you're gonna start to see how they lead to a particular conclusion, right, by the questions that they ask. So, when you're at the memorial, what feelings do you want to have? Right. And it's pride, anger, fear, hope, solemn, which is not really a feeling, but a state, but anyway. Courage, concerned, inspired, peaceful, healing, or spiritual. So already they're, they're putting it into a context about how you're gonna narrate your experience by going to this memorial. Rather than saying, like leaving it open, it's a very kind of leading 
is line of inquiry, right? So they start to gather all this data, and then lo and behold, they, have, they start to rank them in terms of, oh, this should be a healing place, it's peaceful, hopeful, it's supposed to have spiritual, it's supposed to show community pride, it's supposed to show kind of a degree of uh, courageousness. And then you start to see like fear and anger be pretty low in terms of their responses. And then what kind of services they should surprise or they should provide, you know, sanctity, as a positive environment about healing, include the names and stories of the victims and the survivors. Uh, it's a, supposed to be a place of meditation. Uh, it needs to be just simple to understand. So it goes through, but again, you're kind of by asking those kind of questions, you're getting those kind of results. Right, so if you think about the history of other memorial competitions, like Maya Lin's competition for the Vietnam Wall, there's no such like community activity. There's no surveying. It's like it's the act of the artistic genius or the architect, and that by itself is being judged by other people that make those evaluations to say this is the most appropriate. Robert Johnson, who is the chairman of the Memorial Foundation at the time, said, we have democratized the memorial process. And it's like, ooh, why do we need to have it be a democratic? And to say that it's been democratized, you've solicited public input, but that doesn't necessarily make that a de democratic choice, right? So this is supposed to be a competition. What you start to see is that the winning competition entry was basically, it was the one that best adhered to the very survey that they first issued. So it's the one that hits all the check marks. And as they started, so this is the winning design by Hans and Tori Butzner. This is the one that I showed you all those kind of component pieces. And um, it also turns out that Tori, uh, was living in Germany with her husband Hans, uh, was originally from Oklahoma City. So she makes, there, there's a lot that's made in terms of like it's only another native Oklahoman can really understand Oklahoma City. Now that wasn't clear at the time that they did the initial selection, but it adds to that narrative, right? And like, okay, here's how only one of us can understand what we went through, okay? The other thing, and this is probably the most difficult part of my research, was to read some of these community responses that individual people sent back in. And what you'll notice is that there are, there is a strong undercurrent that didn't want, like they felt that this was a rush process, like why are we doing this now? Uh, and it's like all the milestones that you would experience in your life through the loss of a child or a spouse, like your first Christmas, their first birthday that you miss, your wedding anniversary, are just like these devastating narratives that people supplied saying, how dare you do this? Like, I don't want to participate in a process because I don't, I'm not emotionally able to address this loss. I'm still grieving. And yet you're asking me constantly for feedback. So there are letters like this saying that this shouldn't be a good place to go. Like, and they talk about how the victims became heroes, right? So on, instantly these are people that are doing like the work of democracy and that they need to be valorized. And they're saying like, no, these aren't heroes. They didn't make any choice. They were just going about their daily lives. So there is a strong undercurrent of resistance. Um, there are even people saying, like, again, about the role of how if you were injured, like, you just somehow are being forgotten. And a lot of them have these narratives where, like, there are pages and pages long that are these incredibly detailed notes about exactly what happened. And there's almost like a, a hyper narrative that emerges that is incredibly chronological. And you'll start to see this with people with PS, um, uh, post traumatic stress disorder, where it's like, it, like time seems to slow down and like every instance of trauma gets recorded and like the most minute detail, all of which can then serve as triggers to then have people have these kind of reoccurrences. So part of the rationale about why the pastoral and beautiful landscape is to try and provide a setting that is as neutral and as non-threatening as possible, which also then starts to determine the kind of memorial that gets built, right? So it's not meant to be confrontational. It's meant to be therapeutic. 
There are a number of surveys that were just completely blank, and I don't know if you can read it. It says, sorry, I'm unable to fill this out. This is still too powerful for me to think about. Um, here's the other narrative that emerged, and it's one of triumphalism, that it said, on the positive side, how individuals and families have recovered and been made stronger by this experience, and how the city and community have been rebounded. When I was there talking to staff, there's a high level, um, like he's on the executive committee, that basically said to me, after the bombing, it was as if Oklahoma City had a social enema and got rid of all of, like, the crime rate fell to zero. And it, it, Oklahoma City is incredibly, is an incredible monoculture, basically, of, like, white Southern Baptists. So, like, all of a sudden, they felt like everyone was, like, s suddenly, they were all part of the same kind of community. It was a huge um, unifier in the city as well. So I wanted to just detail one of the, another rabbit hole for you. So I was really interested in looking at the official entries. It's like there are 620, why was this the one that selected the winner? It wasn't really because I was overly critical of the actual design, but I was interested. And then the archivist was like, you know that we had other submissions. And I was like, what? Like, no one's written about this. Like, they start, I start to drool. It's like, oh my god. Like, so she wheels out this as, like, here are all the unsolicited memorial ideas. And I'm like, oh my god, I've hit the gold mine, right? <laughs> Stake your claim. Librarians are amazing. I'm going to be, fa I'm going to be famous. And it was a total waste of time. I don't want to say waste of time, but it was totally misguided. So, and it was because I didn't have the framework that I needed in terms of, so I talked about like Freud and Marx and, and Nietzsche and thinking about like the, you know, the political contention about how this gets represented, about who's going who's gonna to be dominant, who's going to assert themselves, who's going to be shafted, right? Who are the people that are going to like be left behind in this like organization? And I was missing all the aesthetic theory that I really needed to have. So one of the things that I started to think of is like, all right, I should be able to determine official entries because of like thinking about professional designers. They should be aesthetically beautiful. And what I soon, soon realized is like, no, there's a lot of really crappy work that's done by professionals, and there are a lot of really good work that's done by amateurs. So going through the unofficial, kind of the unsolicited memorial competitions, you'd start to see images like this, and like this. Oh, I love the, I don't, you probably some of you are old enough to remember computer paper that you actually had to tear off the sides, but that's um, like this, and like this. And all of that is premised on this image. And this image is the image that was gone around the world. And um, this is the image that's primarily identified with the bombing in Oklahoma City. So Chris Fields is a firefighter. He's just actually, I think last year, he's finally just retired from the Oklahoma City Fire Department. And Bailey Almond, and there's something just like really compelling about this as a photograph, right? So you've got like a firefighter, cradling a de dead infant, and it looks like it's just heartbreaking. Like, if you're a parent and you look at this image, it just tugs on your heartstrings. And the funny thing is, is that um, in the interview with Chris Field that I've done, he's like, it was just like, it was a moment. It was like, I was checking to see if the child was alive, and I immediately passed her on. So it makes it look like I'm cradling and like mourning, and that's not the case. Like, this was just like, your training kicks in, I was doing an assessment, this child is dead, I was passing her over. So it was just like this moment, but it's a moment that's been immortalized. And in fact, all those other submissions that I showed you, uh, they actually had a right in the context of the memorial competition not to include any image with reference to Chris Fields or Bailey Almond, because Bailey Almond's mother, who worked across the street, is like, why is my dead baby being represented as like just constant, like she couldn't escape the notion that her child was dead and it's going to be immortalized in the built environment through either statuary or all the other things that you kind of saw. I also wanted to show you some of the problems that I had with regards to um, the submissions. So 
Uh, here's one that's done by a school group, and like they're probably middle school kids, and it's like it's it's got a carousel and teddy bears and ribbons and it's you know every kind of trope and kitsch that you can imagine you could cram into a memorial design is in here, and it's, I feel kind of bad by saying it's kitsch because these are kids and it's like they don't they don't really know any better so maybe it's like vernacular kind of expressions of grief. But there's plenty of kitsch that came from other, like, so statues of angels and ribbons. And again, you're just like, oh my god, this is horrible, right? So, like, I'm thinking originally, like, the first design, the one that won, was probably not the best. And then I'm starting to go through the 623 other submissions, and, like, these are just as bad, if not worse. Um, again, more ribbons, a lot of ribbons. Uh, a lot of expressions of nationalism, so American flags. Uh, this is like having 168 flagpoles to represent the 168 people that passed away. Eagles, right? Again, military prowess started to creep in here. This, like, th the view of Americans had on Oklahoma City was that this was an attack on the nation. If a terrorist group could attack Oklahoma <coughs> City, they could attack anywhere. And so it added to that sense of paranoia um, without really exploring the notion of McVeigh. So I lost about two weeks. I think I was actually really generous in this. I was probably more like four. And it's like, shh, son of a, it, what do you do? Like you go through this and it's like, I, I've got a limited amount of time. I kept all these notes. The one thing that I will say, it, just as a, uh, as a lesson to others, you can be productive with things that don't actually end up in your dissertation. So this is an article that I wrote about the competition. Um, the dissertation doesn't really address the memorial competition at all, even though that was my primary focus for going and working in the archive. So I was able to get an article and a book out of it. So like, hey, it was productive. My dissertation took a very different turn. Is this okay? Like, I, 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 I just wanted to try and show like how theory operates in the background and then how it can get displayed in your, in your particular research. So if, if I'm off topic, um, please let me know. We can talk about theory a little bit more specifically, but I just wanted to try and frame how I did it, which everyone's going to be different. <coughs> So aesthetic theory I didn't really address. I realized that if a deficiency is like, okay, let's get back on the spatial implications of the actual bombing. Uh, so I started to do more historical research. I went outside of the archive looking at the library, trying to pull together as many resources in terms of the, lo uh, the history that it could of Oklahoma City. And one of the things that I started to discover in the upper right-hand corner, that kind of red block, the actual formation of Oklahoma City, um, this has always been part of the concept of the city itself. And the other interesting component about this is like, so nicknames for people from Oklahoma is, it's known as the Sooner State, which is a reference back to the land run. And it was supposed to be that they were gonna open up that territory. It was known as Indian Territory before. This is the location where all the Native American tribes on the East Coast were sent marching along the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. And then uh, Andrew Jackson decided like, yeah, we're gonna settle, like that reservation, no. We're gonna develop this as land and we're gonna send in settlers. So the term sooner is that even though that this was the land run that was supposed to happen in 1889, I forget the specific, May 14th, was supposed to be then opening up and you're supposed to go and state your claim, right? So it's supposed to be like literally like a race. Like I think it's in uh, Dances with Wolves. They have an example of like, you know, a gun being shot and they kind of run across the landscape to state their claim. Sooners is a reference to the people that basically scoped out their, their site before the official start of the land run and staked their claim immediately. So they're the ones that actually went before the official following the rules. And of course, there are white settlers that are then taking over what was guaranteed to be Indian land. So there's already this history of like, here is yet another instance of expression of white power. Um, and those, thinking about that as a power structure and how a pejorative, like someone that's basically like robbed the chance from others, becomes this laudatory thing that then people take pride in. So it's like, that's really weird. Like, that's, that's something that's worth examining more. 
Um, I also started to look at about how Oklahoma City actually was developed and the order. So these are uh, a series of Sanborn maps, which were basically fire insurance maps that people would, um, mm -hmm. the Sanborn company was involved heavily in insurance. So it's incredibly useful because they talk about land use. So if you are a foundry or if you are a chemist, you're going to have to pay higher insurance rates because there's a rate of there's a greater risk of fire. But they did really great detailed work, um, so you can start to understand where buildings were constructed. They're to scale. They also detail building structures and all a, a host of other kind of components that are all really useful historical information. The red little square is again, the ver is the current site of the Oklahoma City National Memorial. So you start to see this kind of incredible population boon. Um, and this is a city that grew rapidly after it was established, like to the point where it's like, I don't even know how it was even remotely sustainable. And these also, what it meant was that a number of buildings that were being constructed were incredibly sh quick, shabby. Um, it was basically take any piece of scrap that you could to, to use as a building material. And really what they try to highlight is like how immensely fast that city grew. And of course that, le that starts to lead this as a, as a kind of a problem. Um, there was a social group um, that are basically like the Shriners. They were uh, they started to form a like a temple. Um, so this is for the India Shrine, which became this is eventually the the house or the the home of the Oklahoma City National Museum and Archives. So this is the building that it's in, and it was built in the 1920s before the stock market crash, and it was like completely opulent. Um, the original building estimate was $200,000 in 1923. When it was actually finished, it was over a million and a half. Um, and of course, it was finished, I think, six months before the stock market crash. And then all of a sudden, it just completely wiped out people's fortunes. In turn, and you can see the, uh, the Indian Shrine Temple, which became known as the Journal Records Building behind this image. They started to establish uh, like modern homes or tenement homes for transients, for workforces. So this is a, an ad that came out um, that really highlighted all the modern efficiencies uh, in the 1930s, include, including like having um, radiators and air conditioning. So those are the three kind of homes that were meant to be rentals. But pretty quickly, um, between the period of like 1929 and the crash of the stock market right through to the start of the Second World War, this area was in rapid, rapid decline. Um, that home state life is actually the Journal Records building and you can see the uh, Melrose Apartments here in front. And the thing that's actually really interesting and you can just basically make it out, this is the survivor's tree that we that we that they've honored and kind of kept and preserved. Uh, there's also the, a very strong religious presence. So you've got St. Joe's Catholic Church here, as well as a Baptist church on the corner. Uh, there's a nunnery and an orphanage actually within this site as well. So by doing looking at that kind of historic land use, this is really kind of like. Don't want to call it a ghetto, but it's definitely a slum, right? So this is like, it's gone into, like, these are, you would go in and buy or rent by the weekly basis for some of these homes. They established a new YMCA on a, an adjacent property to try and take care of some of the crime, to start to think of, like, we need a professional organization to run rather than these, than these flop houses. So I started to do a analysis of the land use to understand like what exactly was going on here. So again, the red dotted line is the actual uh, grounds for the Oklahoma City Memorial. Um, you can start to see the Indian Shrine Temple or the Journal Records building. But the buildings in brown were basically tenement homes. So these are like, um, Again, short-term housing for transients going through the property or going through the city. So there's a lot. And then you'll also start to see the YMCA that they constructed here. Um, it's now a parking lot. They do memorialize the YCMA in the parking lot. Um, and then uh, the religious school, the churches are in blue. So that kind of a civic presence as well. 
so I was like, okay, this is great. Why am I gathering the data? I start to understand like this is like this has fallen. This city has fallen on hard times, and the city leaders knew it. And in 1968, for their coming up for their anniversary or their hundredth anniversary, they hired I.M. Pei, kind of a noted architect, to do a redesign of their city. And uh, the thing about I.M. Pei, and he was really operating kind of under the best assumptions of the time in the mid-1960s. So when you think about the 1960s in the United States, um, ideas of urban renewal are very strong, and those started to kind of translate here. Oklahoma City was actually pretty late in terms of adopting some of the policies for urban renewal, but I am Pei's master plan, so he actually specified a new federal building. Um, it's in, again, that little kind of red square. It's at the top, right, it's a very kind of thin. That would eventually become the Alfred P. Murrow building, so he specified that as a land use. This was also an attempt to radically change the residents that lived in this neighborhood. This is a way of bringing white jobs into a predominantly African-American population, right? So there's a way of that, that social control, about who wins by, right, by redevelopment. Um, the other thing that was specified was that there's gonna be a park with a water feature, and you can make the argument that was what was actually constructed was a park with a water feature, right, in terms of the memorial. But this was really interesting to me to, to be able to find and say like, oh, there's a, there's a precedence that's actually been established you know, 30 years before the actual bombing happened that looked at this in terms of redevelopment of this area. The other thing I just wanted to point out was like there is an interstate here that's also through uh, an African American population. So you think about how people get moved in terms of progress, right? In terms of having like the transportation network being improved. But I also wanted you to have a look at just at the size and the scale of the development in blue in terms of the grain of that urban structure, right? So it's very different from what it was. I'll show you an example. On the left was an air photo from 1964. You can start to see about how uh, vast some of the changes were that IMP was calling for in terms of urban renewal. So basically the creation of these super blocks, we were taking two or three or even four existing city blocks, demolishing them, putting in like uh, a convention center or other civic assets. There are a lot of apartment buildings that were also being kind of specified at the time. Uh, and again, that presence of the interstate uh, through an African American neighborhood. Here's a model that they actually made. And again, what would become the Alfred P. Murrow building. Um, the model's a little bit different, so it was closer to the actual India Shrine Temple, but this building was actually constructed here, and this was left open as a parking lot. So it's always interesting, again, this is the historian in me, it's like, oh wow, this, there's a precedence for all of this. Here's what it was actually built, so that's the Alfred P. Murrow building. It, you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to find an image of the building that's not destroyed. Like, it was such a nondescript building. But you can see that they did have a plaza, which is basically a cap to an underground parking lot. Um, and you, can, you might be able to see that on here, there's a curb cut by the building, and that's where McVeigh basically parked the Ryder truck bomb. And a view of the plaza, and again, you can see the survivor's tree in the background, and it's part of a parking lot. So one of the things that Pay started to specify was this rapid change of the urban conditions. So he, uh, the city started to demolish some amazing old buildings in order for his master plan to come into fruition. Um, they were basically demolishing faster than the reconstruction was happening. So you'd end up with images like this, where you have this huge portion of your downtown completely void as an open parking lot, like tumbleweeds, like it's not like the, the rate of reinvestment wasn't happening. And it like it seemed to be kind of cursed. They went through the savings and loans crisis in the early 80s. That was focused on here. There's like numerous traumas that happened within Oklahoma City that prevented development from happening. So part of my dissertation is really an economic story to talk about how a mayor came about and said like, we have to start reinvesting into our urban infrastructure and we have to do that through a tax levy. So 
He was a businessman. He was, he was the one who was able to get the Oklahoma City Thunder. The, he originally wanted an NHL team because he's a huge hockey fan. This is one of those random things that you start to learn when you do a dissertation. Um, he couldn't secure one, so he, he went to the NBA. Um, but he's really looking at having like numerous civic infrastructure plans being established, right, in terms of like redevelopment in the city. And at the time, um, urban renewal wasn't run in City Hall. It was actually a standalone organization within the federal government. So you had a City Hall that for basically the, the period of 30 years wasn't experienced in any kind of real project management or development of infrastructure. It was all at the federal level. So um, he proposed, uh, Ron Nork proposed a 1% sales tax within the city. And it's going to be collect these funds to redevelop all of these like, projects that never came to fruition under the IM pay master plan. And what you start to see is like some of the, the civic pushback. So newspapers are your friend. Um, Letters to the editor are particularly entertaining. Uh, we need the Old West, not maps. So basically the maps program was the metropolitan area um, like kind of project, which was the tax levy that was being uh, kind of imposed. And basically this author is saying like, we need more imagination. We need to have like staged like fake gunfights in the streets, like it's like the OK Corral. Like, they have the National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City, so it's like playing to their heritage and people are like, uh, dressing up like uh, Native Americans is, and being shot is probably not a good idea for in this day and age. Um, and then, of course, the editorials that were very much pro-business about like we actually need to to do this. So he ran on a kind of campaign on believing in our future. Here's an illustration for that political ad that starts to highlight some of those changes. So it's a new, it's a faux river rock, river walk. Uh, the river in Oklahoma City is called the Canadian River. And its uh, claim to fame is that it's the only river in the state that needs to be mowed. So it's intermittent. Like most of the time it's dry and actually grassland, grasslands are there. But they wanted to be like San Antonio and have a faux river walk. Uh, there's a baseball stadium. There's an entertainment district. Um, they also wanted a new convention center and a host of other kind of things that are reinvestment within the city. Um, here's a better egg. Like, so this is just like, and I think the total was something like, I want to say $300 million of civic reinvestment. And it starts to give you an idea of just like the, how pervasive this building campaign actually was. Uh, they were fortunate enough to have that passed. And the thing was, they sat on that money for about six years. So like if that 1% tax was in place, they're developed, like the, the coffers are, build are building up. And there's a huge controversy about who would actually, what would actually get built. So uh, the Republic, it's a very strong Republican state. This money was accruing. There wasn't really any, um, clear strategy about which project should be built first and everyone had their hands in the till trying to direct money to their favorite kind of key projects in which they were either landowners or other kind of components that they had a financial investment in and then the bombing happened and the bombing actually then started to say like all right we're suddenly getting money we're getting 50 million dollars from the federal government to reestablish a new uh, federal building and the coffers were open like so suddenly there's the political will to make this happen so within the dissertation, I also make the claim that the actual memorial was really part of this much larger civic infrastructure campaign that then allowed the political will to actually spend the money on the civic redevelopment. So that, that is like the dissertation, kind of like that story and narrative that are really, it's a kind of a combination of economic theory, spatial theory, and also kind of that, that social struggle and, and social construction of space. So I talked a, a little bit at the very beginning about like kind of like Marx and Freud and uh, Foucault and Nietzsche. Um, you know, other theorists that really came out for me were like Henry Lefebvre, like the social cr construction of space, the understanding about when you're in a memorial, a certain kind of behavior that is expected. So about how we as people create space. Um, so it's really what underpinned a lot of my research was like being very familiar with that as an argument and then working, of course, with my committee to be able to kind of craft 
and, and hone and give, get readings that are kind of relevant about how that theory could then be applied as this is a particular case study. <sighs> All right, um, it's 10 past 12. This class goes to 12.30? Yeah. So uh, how can I help? Like questions, concerns, comments, happy to share, experiences, the dissertation to get done. Uh, it took me, it's a five-year program, it took me seven years, it is what it is. The best dissertation is a done dissertation. <laughs> First of all, I think we, we should appreciate what you shared. <coughs> yeah, sure, no, it, and fascinating case study. it's, it, so it's, it, I think the, the funny thing is, is that like the theory was always operating in the background and as long as you can start to be able to kind of decode or translate or understand how your particular case is working, um, it can be really, really fascinating to start to see about those kind of connections to the past. So I'll, I'll give you another example, example which might be a little bit more relevant for this particular class. Um, when I was there, one of the submissions in the entry was called The Tragedy of Disengaged Soil. And it's done by a, uh, a couple who teach at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a graphic artist, an amazing, amazing printmaker, and she's a landscape architect. And it's one of the few examples of like, when I looked at this as a submission, it's like, oh my God, why didn't this win? And the concept was, it's what actually was used as the explosive device was fertilizer, right? It was fertilizer and diesel fuel. So they drew a parallel between the Dust Bowl and the environmental degradation that happened within and affected Oklahoma at the time through unsustainable farming practices and said, here is a solution, here's a modernist solution about how we can address this with the advent of fertilizer. The problem isn't like how we've been doing things, we just need a modern solution to solve what we've been doing. So then they pivot and say, well, but that solution is the thing that actually caused this tragedy to happen. So basically they're drawing an arc <coughs> to say, if we had actually readdressed our unsustainable farming practices at the time, we wouldn't have needed modern day fertilizer. And if, because we didn't need modern day fertilizer, this tragedy wouldn't have happened. I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant scheme. And the, the heart of that memorial was actually like the volume of a cube truck. Like it's a sacred space that you couldn't enter. You could only look down into as a void. And it's like, oh my God, that is just brilliant. But it then really charted this whole other kind of alternate history that really called attention into environmental sustainability. The other book that I just kind of came across that was kind of interesting, I think might be relevant, it's called um, Harvest of Rage, and it talks about the American farming crisis in terms of small family farms. So this is at the kind of the advent or emergence of farm aid, and to talk about how corporate kind of uh, conglomerates were buying family farms at an astounding rate and specifically address the notion that if you're a farmer and you lose your farm through bankruptcy, it's not like you started like a, an accounting business or you're a vending machine operator and you've like suddenly gone bankrupt. You've not only gone bankrupt, but you've, got, you've, you've broken the contract that is implicit with your former, with your father and your father's father, right, as a, as a tragedy about losing land. And so it charted the rate of suicides for American farmers. And uh, embedded in, there's this one line that Timothy McVeigh, his father was basically a, a farmer before he gave up the family farm to move to New York. So it starts to implicate like this was actually a much larger kind of political pressure or set of circumstances that McVeigh was being raised saying like his legacy should have been in farming, but because of like the deterioration of how family farms just aren't viable in the states anymore, all of a sudden this other series of options opened up that caused this other kind of outcome. So again, like just to think about how some of the social theory can be operating in the back. And of course, it's not like you can draw a straight line, but it opens up like a discussion point or a really interesting kind of alternative world where here's a set of circumstances that if only one thing was slightly different, this other tragedy wouldn't happen. 
Uh, yeah. So, um, if, if you find yourself wanting to talk <coughs> more about theory or about the mechanics of writing a dissertation, like I have like five books on like the self-help, like write a dissertation 15 minutes a day, and you're like, yeah, right. Um, yeah. Uh, what I will say is writing a dissertation is a gift. No, at no other point in time will you have the focus and the time to do a project as deeply and as thoroughly as you have writing a dissertation. That said, it is also the most isolating, solitary, uh, difficult thing you'll ever do. And it's just like, you, unless you've gone through it, you don't know. And you, I hope you all have su support networks in place, family members. Some of the advice that I was given is like take up like a hobby because you need something else. Uh, all of a sudden, you find yourself like thinking like I need to write another few pages today, and you've got to like I'm not leaving this chair until you do so. And you see the sun come up and you see the sun go down, and you're like, oh, what have I you know I've written a paragraph. It's 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 difficult. It's really hard. Questions about theory? Any comments? Hi. Yeah. When you were piecing together in your mind, I guess you, you made that framework, how things were connecting to each other and making decisions about what to leave out, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, the issue of Timothy McVeigh, for example, right. you mentioned the causes, the motives, and were those at all considered in the memorial? So what was re what was really in yeah what was really interesting to me so you go through this museum and it talks specifically about the bombing, but McVeigh at the time so they they've just done a seven million dollar refurbishment like with other um, displays but I'll get back to that in a moment when I first went through there was no mention of McVeigh so the it was implicit like everyone knew the context of who was responsible for this and part of it was when i talked about the the rush to memorialize this is also going on like it's being constructed at the same time that the legal trials are going on for mcveigh and uh terry nichols and michael fortier who is a conspirator so the thought was at the time was like why would we highlight the perpetrator in the in the memorial museum Plus, we don't want to, we want to be very hands off and let the legal system work through its own causes. So for 20 years, there's, there's, there's two, mention, two mentions of McVeigh. There's a booking photograph when he was pulled over um, for driving with a license plate, which is like bizarre. Um, so there's that photograph and there's a photograph of him being found guilty on a newspaper headline. But that was it in the entire Memorial Museum. So. One of the things that I was really kind of interested is like, how do you display this material? And like the context, like it could have been an earthquake or a natural disaster, but like it's, it's in the background. It was something that it was very Freudian. It's like, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about McVeigh. 20 years have gone by. They have a $7 million refurb. And now you go through and I have like the opposite reaction. They have their get his getaway car front and center. It's the prime thing in the museum. They have the hotel sign from Dreamland Hotel there. Like it's the, it's the marquee of the hotel he stayed at the night before he went. They have his guns on display. They have his t-shirt that was basically like, don't tread on me, like, or the blood of time, or the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed by the blood of, of patriots. So like it's now become this really strange, like originally you didn't want to talk about him at all, and now he's front and center, and it's almost as if it's a shrine to him. So uh, I just actually have submitted the, the dissertation manuscript. I spent the summer reworking it and turning it into a manuscript, so that's being reviewed right now by Temple University Press. But it's like, it, uh, it's crazy making because there has to be this happy medium like okay this is person's responsible sorry I, I kind of went off track you so you were asking about like knowing like the theoretical structure at the time I, I think the thing was is that there were there were so many instances that I just said like that's really odd that's really strange why was that decided that way um, and you start to realize 
that there, there are these other forces that are at work that have very much the financial implications and the life of the city in mind that were separate from the actual tragedy. And it really felt like I was reading accounts about how people were having, um, it was specifically about a public meeting to address like what this memorial should be. And um, the staff in Oklahoma City hired the project manager that was actually responsible for the creation and running of the um, uh, Vietnam Wall Memorial Competition that Maya Lin won. So like that was the gold standard in memorials. So they wanted the person who ran that competition to run their competition. So his name's Paul Sparrigan. He is a very talented architect. He's probably in his 90s now. So he went there and he was starting to run these, these like public meetings and people were standing up and they're talking about um, their dead loved one. And he was like, he was looking around the room, he's like, no, this isn't, this isn't like a therapy session. I'm not, I'm not trained to be a therapist. And then, I'm, I'm sorry about your loss, but like we're here to talk about the memorial. And people wanted to really talk about their loss and because they didn't have the social infrastructure in place to have therapy. So they were doing it through public meetings. So these public meetings went on for like 16 months. So pretty quickly he was fired. I mean, and he, like, he, was a, like, he literally wrote the books on memorial competitions. So you're firing the very <coughs> expert that you hired for that professional knowledge. And it, again, when they talked about the democratization of memorials, it was then bringing in another set of consultants who are like, no, we can make this work. We, can, we need to hear those stories. We need to be engaged. We need to hear people's pain. And again, it's a very different model, but it's not a model that I think most, like most architects, they're, it's beyond them, right? It's not, they're not trained. They're not, you don't have the expertise necessary to try and walk people through this as a, as a form of therapy. So you, these things start to bubble up in, in instances. And again, theory is always kind of in the background, but it's then trying to think of like, how, like, how is it then getting kind of, how is it being deployed and how is it being understood on like the particular circumstances that you're dealing with? So a lot what I kind of went into was like post-traumatic stress disorder and about the treatment of that. And then you start to then see all the goals in terms of like having it be peaceful and serene and pastoral and feel like there's nature. All of those are qualities that are part and parcel of treating people with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, that they need to feel safe before you can even have a conversation in terms, they need to physically feel safe before you can have a conversation about what the, that traumatic event was. So really, it was this weird sense of like, this is a memorial and it's part of the National Park Service, but really it's about, it's about providing the social needs of therapy um, within the public sphere because they don't have the infrastructure to do that. So, yeah, yeah. sure. So uh, we usually use theory, just like what you discussed, um, in guiding our inquiry, like uh, mm -hmm. in terms of asking questions or in terms of like when you search the archives and just trying to understand whether this is something off track or whether you're still on, on the right track. But what about uh, like drawing theory from your work, like uh, in terms of contributing to mm -hmm. teammates with Henry Lefebvre or with these, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so. So if you go through my dissertation, there's no obvious connection. Like, I think that there might be, th there's some people who, when they're in a PhD program, like their, their, their first chapter is really their, intro like their introduction, and then like the first, like the second chapter is really theory. Like it's like, I'm looking at such a, such a, such a, a that I didn't use that as my method. Partially because I had an art historian as my supervisor. <laughs> so, like, that didn't work. So, it's got to be embedded throughout. For me, it's, uh, results may vary, right? So, depending on who you have. I think the thing that is present, and I think what actually made it a stronger work, was that the theory is then diffuse. It's that provides a scaffolding throughout the entire, all of the chapters rather than just as an instant that's, that's then going to be deployed. It makes it much more difficult to write. If it's compact within a chapter, it's like, here's what I'm looking at, here are the different theories, here's how I see the interplay, 
And then, depending on your, the, the nature of your research, here's the experiment or the conditions or the, like the community that I'm working with, or, and here's how I'm seeing this theory kind of lay out. That is very much, that is much more a, for lack of a better term, kind of like a scientific model, where it's like, here's the conditions, here's the, here's the experiment, here's the implication, here are the results. My dissertation, part of the reason it took me two and a half years to write was because it was diffuse throughout and it was telling the, like I had to understand the implications of what I was writing and how it was being deployed by theory. And I'll be honest, one of the hardest things is like writing makes you that much more articulate about, like you don't, sometimes you start writing and you don't know what you're writing. Like you don't know where this research is gonna take you. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really difficult. So if you already know, like you might have inklings, but until you actually sit down and put words on the page, that's when you start to say like, oh my God, I find, and like revising chapters, revising structure. I mean, I had, I had three different versions of the dissertation. Chapters moving around constantly. Uh, at the end of the day, it was 400 pages long, and I had 150 pages of illustrations. Again, don't have an art historian as your supervisor. <laughs> That's part and parcel of it. But it was work that at no other time will I ever have that gift to be able to go that deeply and that thoroughly. And I mean, most people will be proud of their dissertation. Like, I thought, like, damn, I think I got this. Like, I have, I've got something that, like, I didn't understand going into it. And through the act of writing and research, it's like, yeah, I think this is what actually happened. I'm willing to kind of st stake my claim on that. So what I would say is be clear in your methods. Be clear about your honing your writing to be as specific as possible about what you're trying to say. I think one of the common things that, that's, that PhD students unfortunately happens is that you want to get writing too soon and that you actually need to have a lot of like, this is what I think is happening. And it, it's, a, it's a process and I wish it was really convenient. It takes you six weeks to write this chapter. My first chapter, I think, took me a year and a half to write. Mm -hmm. and it was just, it was a grind. And then again, it was like uh, the expansion joint on the wall of the mortar. Like I, I sourced all the materials, like where they came from. I had interviews with the artist that blew the glass that formed the, the panels in the, the, in the chair of empty fields. I mean, I, I have like, I have like three dissertations worth of material that was not in the dissertation. And I found one avenue for publication, but like I could get, I could get started on like white nationalism. That was a whole, uh, that was a whole chapter I was going to write about the, the, the definitions of terrorism. What's amazing to me is that it, at this period of time, this is when um, like basically female reproductive clinics were being bombed. That wasn't being classified as terrorism, but if you cut down a power pole in Santa Cruz, California, you're an eco-terrorist. I mean, crazy stuff. But again, it's like, what's the audience for this? How, you know, is this gonna fulfill my, is this gonna keep my committee happy? Oh my God, yeah. And the, uh, the, I'm trying to give you more advice more than anything else like right, right now. Keep your, keep, keep your advisor happy. Like, be in contact with them. Don't read into like, there are people too. Um, my, dissert, my dissertation advisor uh, went through um, a relationship breakup and I didn't hear from him in six months. And I thought it was personal, like you're on the thin edge of depression when you don't hear from like people don't respond to your emails. Like, I must have done something wrong. It's like, after the fact, you're like, oh no, you're going through hell at this time, so no wonder I didn't hear from you. But by having open lines of communication is really, really important. Um, yeah, I can, I can tell you tales from the fox, the, the foxholes or the trenches, so. The thing is, is like it's also probably one of the most satisfying things you'll ever do. Um, and to do it well is, is pretty remarkable. And I'll also say not everyone can do it. And there's no shame in that, but it, it is really important to be able to take complex theory, find applications, start to see, 
And we all build our knowledge on the people that came before us. So this is just also really important. Like, you might not think that your research has a lot, like the social significance might not be that m important, but you'll find like in 30 or 40 years, if you get that out there, then all of a sudden people pick it up or someone rediscovers your work. It's really, I mean, to find yourself being excited by other people is actually really, really exciting. Um, and we all, like, we're only here for a very limited amount of time, so what are you going to do with that time that we have? So. That's a great way to end this. Mm -hmm. Martin, thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're very welcome. If you have any questions, if you want advice, if you need, like, a shoulder, like, the other piece of advice that was given me that, like, I never told my advisor is through another person who said, who's your secret advisor? And I'm like, what do you mean secret advisor? It's like, it's your, like the person that you go to with all your problems that you would normally take to your advisor, but you don't want to share it with your advisor because you want to keep that relationship productive. So like, you might want to have someone that you just like talk to is like, oh my God, I can't believe that this is what's happening. And things happen, right? So just another, just something to think about. Like, you know, you might not need one, you might need one, it depends on your committee. Pick your committee really carefully. Avoid turf battles, conflicts of personality. Ask your advisor, if I'm thinking about this committee member, would that be productive? There's a whole host of things that I wish I had known <laughs> differently, right? <laughs> so just keep in mind, like those are, I can give you a short list, but thankfully it's, you know, everyone wants you to succeed. This is, it's hard enough writing a dissertation by yourself, first and foremost. Uh, you just don't want to get involved in like, office politics and like intellectual turf battles and all those other things that happen. So by trying to steer that away and being professional and being kind of open and communicative, communicative that's the best thing that you can do at the stage. So I'm happy to talk to any and all of you at some point in time about your research, about your research agenda, about how you're thinking about doing your work. Please come and see me, I'm in room 123. I don't have I don't have any PhD students, so I'm happy to give this, like, like I'm happy to share what I know. Just, just even if you avoid the mistakes that I made, please do so. But thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks. You. So.